This video is about the repeated measures ANOVA. We will go through the following questions. What is a repeated measures analysis of variance? What are the hypotheses and the assumptions? How is a repeated measures ANOVA calculated? How are the results interpreted? And what is a post hoc test and how do you interpret it? We'll go through all points using a simple example. Let's start with the first question. What is a repeated measures ANOVA? A repeated measures analysis of variance tests whether there is a statistically significant difference between three or more dependent samples. What are dependent samples? In a dependent sample, the same participants are measured multiple times under different conditions or at different time points. We therefore have several measurements from each person involved. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say we want to investigate the effectiveness of a training program. For this, we've started looking for volunteers to participate. In order to investigate the effectiveness of the program, we measure the physical fitness of the participants at several points in time, before the training program, immediately after completion and two months later. So for each participant we have a value for physical fitness before the program, a value immediately after completion and a value two months later. And since we are measuring the same participants at different points in time, we are dealing with dependent samples. Now of course it doesn't have to be about people or points in time. In a generalized way we can say in a dependent sample, the same test units are measured several times under different conditions. The test units can be people, animals or cells, for example, and the conditions can be time points or treatments, for example. But what is the purpose of repeated measures ANOVA? We want to know whether the fitness program has an influence on physical fitness. And it is precisely this question that we can answer with the help of an ANOVA with repeated measures. Physical fitness is therefore our dependent variable and time is our independent variable with time points as levels. So the analysis of variance with repeated measures checks whether there is a significant difference between the different time points. But isn't that what the paired samples t-test does? Doesn't it also test whether there is a difference between dependent samples? That's correct. The paired samples t-test evaluates whether there is a difference between two dependent groups. The repeated measures ANOVA extends this concept, allowing you to examine differences among three or more dependent groups. What are the hypotheses for repeated measures ANOVA? The null hypothesis for a repeated measures ANOVA is that there are no differences between the means of the different conditions or time points. In other words, the null hypothesis assumes that each person has the same value at all times. The values of the individual persons themselves may differ, but one and the same person always has the same value. The alternative hypothesis, on the other hand, is that there is a difference between the dependent groups. In our example, the null hypothesis states that the training program has no influence on physical fitness, i.e. that physical fitness does not change over time. And the alternative hypothesis assumes that the training program does have an influence, i.e. that physical fitness changes over time. To correctly apply repeated measures ANOVA, certain assumptions about the data must be fulfilled. Number 1. Normality. The dependent variable should be approximately normally distributed. This can be tested using the QQ plot or the kolmogorov smirnov test. For more information, please watch my video Tests for Normal Distribution. You can find the link in the video description. Number 2. Sphericity. The variances of the differences between all combinations of factor levels or time points should be the same. This can be tested with the help of Marshley's test for sphericity. If the resulting p-value is greater than 0.05, we can assume that the variances are equal and the assumption is not violated. 
In this case, the p-value is greater than 0.05, therefore this assumption is fulfilled. If the assumption is violated, adjustments such as Greenhouse Geyser or Heinfeld can be made. Now I'll show you how to calculate and interpret an analysis of variance online with DataTab. And then we'll go through the formulas to explain how to calculate the analysis of variance with repeated measures by hand. To calculate an ANOVA online, you simply go to datadap.net and copy your own data into this table. I use this example dataset. You can find a link to load this example dataset in the video description. Make sure that your data is structured correctly, i.e. one row per participant and one column per condition or time. Now we click on the Hypothesis Test tab. At the bottom, we see the three variables before, in the middle and end from the dataset. If we now click on all of them, a repeated measures ANOVA is automatically calculated. Firstly, we can check the assumptions. Here we see that the Marshley's test for sphericity results in a p-value of 0.357. This value is greater than 0.05 and thus the assumption is fulfilled. If this is not the case, you can tick Sphericity correction. I will explain how to test the normal distribution in a separate video. In our example now, we will assume normal distribution with a lot of clashing of teeth. If the assumption is not fulfilled, you can simply calculate the non-parametric counterpart to the repeated measures ANOVA, the Friedman test. This does not require your data to be normally distributed. First of all, if you do not know exactly how to interpret the individual tables in your analysis, you can simply click on Summary in Words or on AI interpretation for the tables. But now back to the results. First we see the null and the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that there is no difference between the dependent variables before, in the middle and end. And the alternative hypothesis is that there is a difference. At the end of the test we can say whether we reject this null hypothesis or not. Now we see the descriptive statistics and a box plot. We then get the results of the ANOVA with repeated measures. In this table, the p-value is the most important value. It is 0.01 and indicates the probability that a sample deviates as much or even more from the null hypothesis as our sample. With a p-value of 0.01, the results are statistically significant at the conventional significance level of 0.05, which means that there are significant differences between the mean values of the three levels before, in the middle and end. This rejects the null hypothesis and we assume that there is a difference between the groups and that the training program or therapy has a significant effect. If you want an interpretation of the other values in this table, simply click on AI interpretation. Finally, here is the table for the Bonferroni post hoc test. Since the p-value of the analysis of variance is smaller than 0.05, we know that there is a difference between one or more groups. With the post hoc test, we can now determine between which groups this difference exists. We see that there is a significant difference between before and end and in the middle and end. Both have a p-value of less than 0.05. How do you calculate an analysis of variance with repeated measures by hand? Let's say this is our data. We have five people, each of whom we measured at three different points in time. Now we can calculate the necessary mean values. First we calculate the mean value of all the data, which is 5.4. Then we calculate the mean value of the three groups. For the first groups we get a mean value of 5. For the second, a value of 6.1 and for the third, a value of 5.1. And finally, we can calculate the mean value of the three measurements for each person. So for the first person, for example, we have an average value of 8 over the three measurements 
And for the last person we have an average value of 5. Now that we have all the mean values we need to calculate the required sums of squares. But note, our goal is the so-called f value and subsequently calculate a p-value from it. There are different ways for getting this f-value. I will demonstrate one common way how to do this. Depending on which statistics textbook you use, you may come across a different formula. But back to the calculation. Let's start with the sum of squares within the subject. We obtain this by calculating each individual value x, m, i, minus the mean value of the respective subject, squaring this and adding it up. So we start with 7 minus 8 squared plus 9 minus 8 squared until finally 3 minus 5 and 7 minus 5. We can then calculate the sum of squares of the treatment, i.e. the sum of squares of the three points in time. We obtain this by subtracting the total mean value from each group mean value, squaring it and adding it up. n is the number of people in a group. So we get 5 minus 5.4 squared plus 6.1 minus 5.4 squared plus 5.1 minus 5.4 squared. Now we can calculate the sum of squares of the residual. We get this by simply calculating the sum of squares within the subjects minus the sum of squares of the treatment. Alternatively, we can also use this formula. Here xmi is again the value of each individual person, ai is the mean value of the respective group, pm is the mean value of the respective person of the three points in time, and g is the total mean value. We can then calculate the mean squares. To do this, we divide the respective sum of squares by the degrees of freedom. The mean square of the treatment is therefore calculated by dividing the sum of squares of the treatment by the degrees of freedom of the treatment. The degrees of freedom of the treatment are the number of factor levels minus 1, so we have 3 time points minus 1, which is 2. The mean square of the residual is obtained in the same way. Here the degrees of freedom are the number of factor levels minus 1 times the number of subjects minus 1. We get 2 times 7, which is equal to 14. Now we calculate the f value, which is done by dividing the mean square of the treatment by the mean square of the residual or error. Finally, we calculate the p-value using the f-value and the degrees of freedom from the treatment and residual. To calculate the p-value, you can simply go to this page on DataTab. The link can be found in the video description. Here you can enter your values. Our f-value is 1.69, the numerator degree of freedom, i.e. that of the treatments is 2, and the denominator degree of freedom, i.e. that of the error, is 14. We get a p-value of 0 0.22. The p-value is greater than 0 0.05 and therefore we do not have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Of course, we can then compare the results with DataTab. To do this, we copy the data back into this table and click on the variables we can see that we also get a p-value of 0.22 here. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video.